Hello, everybody. Thanks, Phil. Um, I am from Australia, so you do get to listen to my totally amazing Australian accent for the next 30 minutes. Uh, as Phil said, my name is Mandy. I'm on Twitter. I'm also on CodePen, and that is me, dressed as Batgirl, so you'll be able to find me very easily on Twitter, not in real life. Um, it's just mess with people a bit. Uh, all the demos I'm going to show you are up on CodePen, so you can go and check those out later if you want to. More importantly, though, this is my dog. His name is Jello, and the reason that I like to tell people this is in my demos, I use what I call Jello Ipsum, uh, and without the context that it's a dog, it can be very confusing for people. So when you see the word Jello, you can think of him, and hopefully my ulterior motive is you'll smile and you'll enjoy the talk even more because dogs are cute and mine is especially so. Biased. Uh, but uh, sadly, I don't get to talk about Jello. Um, what I'm going to talk about is creating responsive typography, specifically with variable fonts. Now, I know this isn't really specifically related to the Jamstack, but uh, variable fonts can be used in any website. And there's a few benefits that you'll get out of variable fonts, like performance um, and interactivity that we'll talk about. And hopefully, it'll inspire you to do some cool things on your websites little bit of housekeeping. I have a website called variablefonts.dev. There's a getting started page on there. So if you are suffering from that sugar low and you miss a bit, you can just go there, check it out later. Um, but do try and pay attention because there's some fun stuff and I don't want you to miss out. And there are like secret jellos in my talk, so you want to look out for them as well. OK, important background information. I don't make fonts. I'm not a web typography expert. I wouldn't even consider myself a designer. I'm more of a developer. I'm someone that likes to tinker and have a play. And as a result of that, uh, a couple of years ago, I started making text effects like these ones. They're all up on CodePen. But when I was doing that, I came across variable fonts. And it became clear to me very quickly that variable fonts offer us some very unique opportunities. And the reason for that is that a variable font is one font file that acts like multiple fonts. And this all comes down to how the font is made. So at the moment, when you have a font, you might have several different font weights, for example. And these will exist as separate individual files. With a variable font, all of that information exists in one file. So this is accomplished by different axes within a font. So a variable font can have one or more axes, and they represent different style variations, like weight, for example. And along that axis, it uh, has a different levels of extremes for that style. So you might have a light weight to a really heavy weight. And while we still have access to things like regular and bold along a weight axis, these are named instances. Variable fonts can be interpolated, and that means that we have access to all of the ranges and values in between those uh, standard weights that we're used to. And because they can be interpolated, it means that we can animate them, and we can create really beautiful, smooth transitions between the different styles. And this doesn't just apply to uh, a single axis at a time it can apply to the combinations of these axes as well. So whether it's weight or width or something a little bit weird. This font is called Decovar. It's by David Burlow. And it's an experimental variable font that allows us to create really interesting and cool effects. And later, I'm going to show you heaps of examples that use Decovar, because I really like it. But before we get into that, I want to get all of the kind of boring housekeeping out of the way. My dog again. He's very cute. Relaxing. We can use variable fonts now. Browser support's really good. The only caveat I would add is that for a browser like Firefox, you need a more modern operating system. Uh, on a Mac, it's High Sierra and above uh, because it relies on the operating system to render the font in the browser. But totally able to use it now. If you need to support IE, you can fall back to um, a different font in your font stack, or you can use something like CSS feature detection um, to only load the font when you need it. We still use Fontface just like we do now, and it's pretty much the same. 
The main difference is how we define variations for descriptors, like font weight, font stretch, and font style. So at the moment, if you were to define maybe two different font weights, you would have a font face block for, say, the regular version, and then you would do another font face block, and that would be for, I don't know, bold. And you would keep doing this until you had all the different styles that you needed. But with a variable font, you don't need to do that. You can just specify a range. So in this case, it's 200 to 700. And then when you reference the font in your CSS, you can just pick any number between 200 and 700, so 658.756, whatever you want to do. Now, this is really, really good for weight because we have a CSS property for that. That's known as a registered axis. So there are five registered axes at the moment, weight, width, slant, italic, and optical size. And these are all mapped to pre-existing CSS properties. But if we want to do something custom like that Decovar example that I showed you, we need a new CSS property. And that's called font variation settings. And font variation settings allow us to define as many registered and custom axes as we want. So a registered axis just means that it's defined in the spec. The custom axes are defined by the font creator. And the way we reference them is by a four character string. So I made this one up, jello, of course and an associated number value, which just represents along the axis where you want to um, access. Now, the character code for a custom axis is defined by me. Registered axis defined in the spec. Um, weight is WGHT, for example. And though you can use the registered axis in font variation settings, typically we would recommend that you don't. Main reason. If there's a CSS property for it, use it. It's easier for the people in your team or yourself to manage your typography. Plus, you don't have to change what you're already doing. So I would keep font variation settings for custom axes and use the mapped properties where you can. Now, if you don't use FontFace and you're more of a Google Fonts fan, that's fine. Google Fonts, as of about a month ago, released a beta version of the Google Fonts API that supports variable fonts. It's pretty similar to what we do now. The main difference is how you specify the range. I'm not going to go deep into it, but there's a post up on variablefonts.dev if you want to check that out. It's a great way to play with variable fonts because you don't have to worry about licensing or anything like that. So definitely go and check it out. So considering that we can use variable fonts, doesn't really change how we do things, which is great. I wanted to touch on performance, because performance is a really big thing for us at the moment, particularly when we're loading so much JavaScript into our front ends. When it comes to a variable font, it's still a font. You still need a good font performance strategy. Uh, that might be subsetting or uh, using font display, stuff like that. So these things still matter. But there are a couple of things about variable fonts that make them pretty good for performance. And the first one is that variable fonts by the nature of how they're made, reduce the number of font requests simply by being a variable font. So at the moment, when we think about reducing the number of font requests, we would weigh up the cost of design over the cost of performance. And we'd have to justify the cost before we added any new styles. But because all that data about different weights, for example, exists in the one file, we've just reduced the number of files immediately by using a variable font instead. So this is a really huge benefit by just changing the format. Plus, you get all of the extra style opportunity within the font. So it's a massive benefit. Of course, you're probably wondering if all of the data is in one file. What does that do to file size? Terms and conditions apply to the following statements. In my experience, variable fonts are either on par or better in file size than the combination of the standard equivalents. So if you think about combining all of the fonts, weights on your page, for example, into one complete value, a variable font is typically better. So an example of this is Source Sans Pro. In WAF 2, a single weight is 111 kilobytes. A variable font is 112. So for an extra kilobyte, 
you not only get the single weight, you get all of the other standard weights plus all of the values in between. Now, Source Ans Pro is a really big font. It supports lots of languages, so you definitely want to subset this. But even if you had just two versions of a font weight in your website with Source Sans, the variable font is still better in overall file size. So that's something to keep in mind. You can get a lot of performance benefits simply by using a variable font, but it's also obviously going to depend on the fonts, how many you're loading in your website. So your mileage may vary, but it's definitely worth checking out. So at this point, this is where the fun begins. If we're not limited by technical considerations like browser support, the way that we use them is very similar to what we're already used to. Performance can be a huge benefit. We're not going to cause any major problems by using variable fonts. This means that we can shift our focus. And we can start to experiment with uh, creating uh, better experiences for our customers. Creativity can determine the choices that we make, and we don't need to trade off design for performance. So for example, this uses 13 different font weights, half of which don't currently exist in the standard font. We gain so much more flexibility in our design opportunities, and designs which would have previously been a heavy burden on performance or impossible because of the technical limitations are now completely possible. And when you look at something like this, the tone and the intent and the rhythm and the meaning behind the words changes depending on how you represent that content. So this allows us to represent our content more effectively without worrying about how many fonts we're loading into the page. And we can start to forget about the perceived limitations and the limitations we put on ourselves because of performance and focus on representing our context in more meaningful ways. Jello ipsum. It's great. And we can embrace the learnings of print design as well. I mean, this is a terrible design. Um, again, not a designer, but lots of Jello, which is great. CSS grid, blend modes, shapes. These things combined with variable fonts allow us to represent our content in much more interesting and more engaging ways. But unlike print, we can embrace the interactivity and um, the flexibility of the web. And because variable fonts have that interpolated range of values, we can start to create animations or transitions with our text, which is something we've never been able to do without something like SVG or Canvas or JavaScript. But we can do this with just a little bit of CSS using techniques we're already familiar with. So this is a H1 and some CSS. It's editable, selectable, searchable, copy and paste it. It's accessible via a screen reader. And it'll work pretty much everywhere that supports variable fonts. And I love this example. It was the second demo that I ever made. And what I think is really great about it is it shows the possibilities of really interesting things that we can do with variable fonts. And we can do these things with a little bit of CSS. This specifically is how I made it. I have my variable font, Decovar, by David Berlow. I have an animation property, a keyframe animation, two axes. One's called inline. That's going to be 1,000 for the whole way. The other one is called Skeleton Worm. Weird, but cool. Starts at zero, goes to 1,000. And that's literally it. Obviously, I have some extra CSS for texture, but it's a couple of text shadows and a background image. The main effect is accomplished because the font does all the heavy lifting. David did all the hard work, and I just swooped on in and chucked a little bit of CSS and made a really cool thing. And when Decovar was made, David didn't expect this to happen with it. This, nobody was expecting something like this to be made. So if you think about this, this is a new technology where we get to decide how we're going to use it. And that's very similar, I think, to where uh, the Jamstack is at the moment. Like We get to define the future of that, and I think that's very, very exciting. And there's lots of exciting things that you can do with variable fonts. This is a handwriting font. Again, it's just a H1 and some CSS. 
little bit of JavaScript in this one just to split the letters, but you don't, you don't need to use JavaScript. It's by a foundry called Underwear. It's a great name. This is a hover with a transition applied. Really simple, just changes the weight. This one, I don't really know. I just think it's cool. I haven't quite figured out a use for it yet, but I, I'm, I'm so close, I can just feel it. This one, this is Decovar again. Like I said, I use it a lot. I just want you to just, just look at how beautiful that is. What I think is great about this example is that beautiful long text shadow made with CSS. I love how it disappears as parts of the characters disappear. It's a really awesome demonstration of how different variable fonts are to other fonts and text on the web. This one, bit of background. I've been making text effects for ages now, and I got a bit bored because they kind of appeared, and that was just not fun for me anymore. So I started making stuff like this. It's live demo time, so, you know, see how this goes. OK, so I have a backup plan for this. I have a button we can click, but that's super boring. I don't want to do that. Instead, we're going to use the speech recognition API, and we're going to say a word. And then Marshmallow, my dragon, that's the dragon's name, bit of a theme, he is going to make text appear in fire, because he's a, he's a fire-breathing dragon. So let's hope it works. Fire. Yay! Thank you. Marshmallow did all the hard work. This uses Decovar again. It's like four axes, bunch of blend modes, heap of text shadows. But what I love about this is that we create these really interactive experiences with just text, um, just a, a JavaScript, some CSS, some text, some illustrations, and we can combine text into these interactions, which usually would have been restricted to um, SVGs or Canvas. I think that's really, really exciting. And when you think about uh, static sites or, or the Jamstack, and, you know, people tend to think that they're not very interactive or, or exciting. This kind of stuff can allow us to create better experiences. But it's not just that variable fonts can create cool or beautiful or interesting effects. What they demonstrate is that as developers and designers, we can now control the font itself. And what that means is that variable fonts allow typography on the web to adapt to the flexible nature of screens, environments, and devices. So at the moment, uh, the CSS Media Queries Level 5 specification is working on giving us more control over our designs based on environment, light contrast, color schemes, dark mode, probably something you're familiar with. And using variable fonts in these things is really straightforward. This is a font called Chi. I really like Chi as well. It's by Ono Type Co. Really, really simply, we can create a media query of prefers color scheme dark, change our axis in that um, media query, bit of a transition for fun, and we can create something like this. It's dark mode, and it oozes, because it's dark mode. I thought this was really funny when I made it. Um, it was Halloween. I was like, ha, ah, you know, it'd be really great if my website was all slimy and oozed. It's probably a bit of a dumb example. But more practically, we can modify the contrast and the styles of our websites to ensure better legibility and better accessibility of our text. When you think about color contrast and things like that, uh, often we just focus on color. But Fonts play a really important role in how legible something can be. So the fact that we can now control the font uh, in our CSS or with our JavaScript to make it more accessible and more legible uh, along with color contrast and color schemes, this gives us a lot more flexibility, and it allows us to take advantage of our users' preferences. But more interestingly, when we have these variable fonts, it also means that our users, if they want to create their own custom style sheets, which a lot of people do for accessibility reasons, 
they now have access to the options along the variable font axes. So that means that they can better customize the experience to make it suit their needs. And that, that's really exciting to me because I think it's really important to think about our users and focus on what our users need and require in their websites. And accessibility is really important to me. So if I can give people more opportunity to make it suit their needs, that's really important. But it also means that we can design our typography to adjust to things like screen width. So that might allow us to change the font weight, width, optical size, or other axes to be more readable on larger or smaller screens. So maybe where the viewport is really big and the text is really large, you might have a lot of detail in the font. Whereas when it's smaller on a tiny screen in a more confined space, maybe you'll reduce the width so that it fits better. I mean, I can't really think of a good reason that we would do that, like fitting stuff in a box. <laughs> but I'm sure there's plenty of ways that you can use that. Or uh, another example is, uh, you know when you have these beautiful designs and everything fits on like very specific breakpoints, and then you build it, and that just in reality doesn't work? With this example, as the viewport gets smaller, Rather than having the headline wrap onto a new line, I'm reducing the width a little bit. And that means that I can maintain the integrity of the design and not lose any of that um, beautiful, I mean, I'm calling my own rubbish design beautiful, but not a designer. You can see the benefits of this, right? It allows us to have that control and determine when we want things to break and when we want things to wrap. And that's really, really important. And it's something that's been quite difficult uh, in, the, in the past. Now, the way that I did this was with a bit of JavaScript. And I want to show you the JavaScript because it's only a little bit. And the reason that I want to show you is once you have it, it can apply to a whole bunch of different things. So what we're going to do is match our font weight to our viewport size. As the viewport gets smaller, the font weight is going to get heavier. And we need a couple of things to do this. First, we need the font weight range, so 200 to 900, and then the viewport range, so 320 pixels to 1440 pixels. Could be whatever you want. We have a tiny little function. First, we need the viewport, current viewport of the user, window.inner width, something like that. Then we take that and we minus the minimum viewport size. Divide that by the maximum minus the minimum viewport size. And what this is going to do is give us a decimal value that we can use to calculate our font weight scale. So we take that decimal value, it's somewhere between 0 and 0 0.99. We multiply that by the minimum font weight minus the maximum font weight, and then we add the maximum font weight back on. Once you've got that updated in your CSS, I'm using CSS custom properties, but you can do it however you want. Pass that through to your CSS. Whack the function in an event listener, resize. And that's all you need to do. That is literally the JavaScript I wrote. Obviously, you can improve performance, all of that kind of stuff. But for the most part, that's going to achieve fixing it to viewport. And once you have that, you can do cool things like scroll events. Uh, this one I love. It took me longer to figure out what text to put in it than it did to actually write the code. Um, and I think this is really cool for, you know, like uh, branding websites where you scroll the page and stuff like pops in. Um, you can do cool stuff with your text now as well. And um, this is, I can't remember if I said this is Chi by Ono Type Co. You can also do stuff like this. This is device orientation. My phone is cracked in this. <laughs> it's worse now. Not sure if it was like clairvoyant or, or whatever, but um, this one changes the slant. And then as it gets to a certain orientation, it'll just slam into the side. It uses splitting JS to group everything. Uh, this one I made recently, as you rotate the phone, uh, the letter, each individual letter, the weight will increase. And then I've also added a transform. And this one, I could have shown you a video of this, but um, I really, really love this example. Uh, so I'm going to show you it for reals. So this, this is called Whoa by Scribbletone. 
I'm not even joking, that's literally what it's called. And it uses the position of the mouse to change the different axes. Um, I actually changed the colors of this a little bit so it would match the branding. I thought that was really nice. Um, and I love this example because it changes the rotation and the stretch. Um, and it's a really, really cool and interesting way to create interactive experiences with our, with our websites. So another good example, I've got to lean over here so I can see. This one uses the Web Audio API. And it's listening to the volume of my voice, which I'm very loud, so it tends to um, hit the confetti um, way more regularly when I talk versus other people. And what I think is cool about this is when you think about interfaces like Google Home and Alexa, uh, you can create speech-to-text um, interfaces. But the text at the moment is really static. There's no tone or intent conveyed. Um, you lose all of that stuff that you get when you listen to someone speak. So right now, it's a little bit tricky because speech recognition, web audio API don't really join together particularly well. But in the future, I can see a lot of benefits for this with variable fonts to help represent tone, pitch, volume, and try and convey a bit more meaning, maybe some machine learning or something like that to help us represent interfaces in more interesting ways. I think I have time. Do you want to make it do the thing? OK. So last time I did this, Phil was there, and he gave me a hard time because I got everyone to woo at me. So instead, we're going to woo for Phil and for the Jamstack conference organizers and all the other speakers. OK, so one, two, three. Woo! Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Hope you like that, Phil, wherever you are. Um, oh, I've lost my, uh, my mouse. Where is it? There. So um, this next example, I'll just uh, stop the web audio from running. I'm just going to get my prop. Um, I got a torch here. Uh, so this uses the ambient light sensor in my device. So you kind of think of it like um, when your phone dims in low light environments. It's the same um, kind of interface. And what I'm doing is changing the axis based on the input from the light. So if you think about this, um, similar to contrast modes and accessibility, you can um, make your text more readable and more legible depending on the environment the user is in. So if it's really dark, maybe you want to change the weight or reduce some of the um, detail in the font so it's easier to read. And I think um, for really critical interfaces, this could be really beneficial to make sure that we're creating an interface that people can actually you know, use and, and see. But also, because this is me and I like to make fun stuff, this one, this is made by um, Typature. Um, it, the author who makes this font makes the most incredible variable fonts you've ever seen. And he sent me this one, and I made, I made this. So how cool is that, right? This blooms, because you know flowers need light to bloom, most of them anyway. And it will change depending on the amount of light in the room. And if you think about this, when we're imagine creating a website that changed depending on the environment the user was in. Like you could completely change the mood and the experience for people. And for storytelling or games or branding, you could change that experience. And something that might have been quite static um, before can start to become really immersive. And to me, that is very, very exciting. But it's only because variable fonts give us more control over these elements that we can fine tune things like um, the font characteristics to maximize things like legibility, readability, accessibility, and the interactivity of the text that we have in our sites. And while some of these examples might seem trivial, they're just demonstrations of the possibilities. It's up to you to figure out how we can use this technology, because it's still relatively new, and people are still trying to figure out the best way to utilize it. And while there are practical ways that we can do this th stuff, there's also fun and engaging and interactive things we can do as well. In my opinion, there's never been a better time to be a developer or a designer on the web. And I know that there's some bad stuff happening around the place. 
but we have more opportunity than ever to create more accessible, more performant, uh, more meaningful, and more interactive experiences for our users, and do so in a way that gives them what they really need. And variable fonts is just one of the technologies, like the Jamstack, that allows us to do that kind of thing. So with variable fonts, at least, we can make it more performant. But at best, we can make something that's more accessible, more performant, more usable, more interactive, more engaging, and more immersive. And to me, that is a really, really exciting future for web typography and for all of us who get to build amazing websites. Thanks very much. Here's some resources. Definitely follow these people on Twitter, because they're amazing. Um, the bottom three are um, type foundries. Um, David and Jason are amazing um, people. Jason does a lot of variable font stuff. My website, variablefonts.dev. And if you're looking for fonts, v-fonts.com is a great place to go. Thank you.